You're listening to the A Minute to Midnight show. My name is Tony and today on the show we have as a guest the return of Carla Butard. We welcome back Carla Butard to the A Minute to Midnight show. It's, it's nice to have you back so soon after our last recording, Carla. Thank you so much. It's always a privilege to be able to be on the air and share the Word of God. And it's great for our listeners to hear what you have, the wealth of knowledge that you have. So what are you, um, what are you wanting to cover today, Carla? Well, um, I heard a prophet years and years and years ago say that one of the, the greatest things that would be hitting the church in the last days is lack. And I found that interesting, but, you know, I I can see the truth of that. And even um, in my growing, my journey with the Lord um, have been in that place many times myself. And so I I know that it is an area that um, Satan really likes to keep us in captivity in. It certainly is, and it's something that I've had struggle with for a long time. I was thinking about it this morning and thinking I was talking to one of my friends a few days ago, and he was saying he got a shock because his tax bill was going to be so big, and he's a great friend, been a great friend for years, and I was thinking, man, your tax bill is bigger than my total income. (laughs) And I was thinking, wow. Um, (laughs) So it's beyond my comprehension to even think. Yes, I know know people like that. (laughs) <laughs> and he's wondering how he's going to pay his tax. It's true. Bill. It's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know my my son, our oldest son, is a doctor, and he was telling us how much his taxes were. And I think I think it's like maybe two years of our income. <laughs> yeah. But you know, we 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 live very modestly, so we can we can do all that we need to do on our income. But you know, here's the here's one of the if, if When I talk to new Christians, I like to encourage them not to uh, limit God's provision for them by the size of their paycheck. No, that, I think that's something that, that we can easily fall into the trap of and people look at somebody's prosperity, financial prosperity, and how well they're doing in a worldly sense and thinks that equates to God's blessing being on the, those people's lives, but it doesn't necessarily mean that at all. In fact, it just um, makes me think of Book of James, you know, uh, chapter five, and it says, "You've lived on earth in pleasure and luxury, and have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter." And there's a whole lot about the the wages, you know, not being paid, and and so being financially prosperous and rich certainly doesn't equate to. Um, you know, necessarily being God's blessing at all. In fact, Jesus said it's uh, easier for a rich man, for a, sorry, for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. So it's like finding the balance, I think. That's to me, is, is where I want to, you know, know where the, the actual balance in this is because we don't, we shouldn't be living in lack, but obviously we shouldn't be striving after right. riches as our primary focus either. True. Interesting that you brought up a scripture in James because um, I also had one in my notes and it's uh, James 5, chapter, no, chapter 5, verse 4. And in that scripture, and I'm going to, I'm going to pull it up and read it because. Yeah, I just read verse 5. So you've got verse 4. Yes. Yes. Let let me um, just touch on that. I'm going to pull that up. In this, in these uh, scriptures, James is talking to rich men that evidently weren't in lack or whatever. But he says to them in verse four, "Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth, and the cries of them which have reaped." Or entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Now, I heard that scripture at a time that Mike and I were financially destitute. When I heard the scripture, something was 
so uh, ignited in me. I was so excited to hear this scripture, but I didn't really understand why I was so excited about the scripture because it really didn't mean a whole lot to me, except that my husband had gone to work for um, a new a new business. The boss that hired him from his where he was working before told him that he was going to pay him the same amount that he was making at this other place, but it was closer to where we lived, which was good. So Mike took the job. Well, when the first paycheck came, it wasn't what the man said. And so that, you know, we lived on a tight budget. And when that happened, I think the, um, it was like $160 short of what he should have been paid, which meant $320 a month out of our monthly income. Now that put us in a, a real bind. There's a whole long story all around that that I'm not going to get into today. But when I, I read this scripture, because I saw that this uh, person that James was talking to was basically saying, look, you hired people to do a job and you told them that you were going to pay them a certain amount, but you didn't give them what you said you were going to pay them. And it says that the higher that means the money, the money that belonged to those guys um, was crying out. It was crying. So, you know, I got to thinking about if that money that belongs to us is crying, that means money has a voice, if you will. Just like the blood of um, Abel's blood cried out from the ground. Remember, God said, the voice of your brother's blood yes, yeah. cries out. I do, yes. It also says that if we don't worship the Lord, Jesus Christ, that even the rocks would cry out. There's another scripture that talks about the beams, the wood in this building, that the beams were going to cry out. So I have tend to think a lot. <laughs> in fact, when I was in a depression, I went to the psychiatrist and I was telling him things that would really bother me. And he said, you know what? You think too much. <laughs> and I said, I know, I know. Yeah. Tell me how to stop it. Yeah. But but it, it's not a bad thing because I can, you know, the word says that Unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Now that, I like that because I am a big thinker and God is able to do even bigger than that. So I don't, it doesn't bother me anymore that I think like this. But in this scripture, I saw that the money that Mike's boss withheld from us, that that money was crying out to be in our possession. Okay, then I saw like um, a mother and a child who get uh, separated in a department store, say, and the mother realizes that the child is not there. The child realizes that mommy's not there, and suddenly they begin to cry out for each other. The mother is calling the child's name. The child is calling mommy, mommy, and those cries bring them together right? Yes. Yeah. So in, in the sense of things that have been withheld from you in the wrong by fraud, the man was wrong to withhold their money from them and they're crying out. So who do we cry out to? Well, at the same time, um, you know, when I would pray about our finances, I would cry out to God about our finances. Lord, your word says in um, Malachi, let me go there. Because, you know, I, I begin to um, look for the reasoning uh, because the word says, you know, that um, if you love the Lord and you obey the Lord, blessed will be your your purse and blessed will be your kneading trough and all these things. And so um, let me find that scripture because I don't like to misquote it. Malachi, and I think it's chapter three. 
and it's talking about um, the Lord was telling these that they had robbed him. And they said, well, how have we robbed you? And so he tells them in verse, verse 8, he says, will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me, but ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings? Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And, and see, I used to stop at, at the end of verse 10, but at this time, because I was saying to the Lord, your word says that if we tithe, and we were, we were tithers, that you would pour out all these blessings. Where are they? I'm not seeing the blessings. In fact, it's like the enemy is eating our lunch. And so in verse 11, Here's one of the benefits. You know, Psalm 103 says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And then it goes on to say, you know, he's healed all your diseases. He is, um, he'll protect you from the destroyer, all these things. So here is a benefit in Malachi 3.11. It says, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all the nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Okay, so with these scriptures in mind, I'm crying out to God and um, talking about this windows of blessings and that the enemy was like eating our lunch. And, and then all of a sudden, I had an open vision of the windows of heaven and they were wide open and the blessings of God were being poured out to his people. But then I saw underneath the windows of blessing, big demons that were catching the blessings and funneling them over into what was the enemy's camp. Now, you know that little song, I don't know if y'all sing it um, in New Zealand, but in America, we have this song that we sing, and oh, we have great fun singing it, and it goes like this, I went to the enemy's camp, do you know that song, yeah, Tony? Yeah, yes, yeah, I do, yep. And I uh, took back what he stole from me, and oh, we just have, we go through these little motions of grabbing things back and all of this, and he's under our feet, and we're stomping our feet. Yeah. But one day when I was singing that song, I just had to stand still. And I, I was saying to the Lord, Lord, who do I know that actually went to the enemy's camp and took back what he stole from them? I don't know one soul that can say that. And is there really an enemy's camp? And if there is, where is it? And how would we go about getting back those things? That have been stolen from us. Because I'm going to tell you at that time in my life, the enemy had stolen much from Mike and me. A lot. That's a good question. And so all of these, yes, all of these things that I had been pondering all fell together with this open vision. Because over uh, right below to the left. This is where the enemy's camp is. God showed it to me. Right to the left of and below the windows of blessings is the enemy's camp. And those demons are catching the blessings of God and funneling them over into the enemy's camp. And Satan himself was standing outside the gate of that of this camp. And what it looked like, I'll tell you what it looked like. I don't know if they have these in New Zealand, but in America, they have these um, big fields. I'm talking acres and acres and acres and acres of fenced in property that are full of wrecked, rusty, broken down automobiles. It's like a junkyard. 
of all of these wrecked automobiles. And some places will sell parts off of the, you know, it's like a um, salvage yard or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, that's what the enemy's camp looked like. It was acres and acres of the blessings of God, not junky cars, but blessings of God fenced in. And Satan is standing outside the gate, picking his teeth with a toothpick and laughing hysterically because he is robbing us blind. And we don't even know that it's him robbing us blind. Many times people hit these places in their lives and it's like, Lord, why are you letting this happen to us? Which is an important point that I like to make that if you don't factor in the enemy, uh, you know, sometimes people say, you talk about the devil too much. You give the devil too much credit. No, that's not it at all. I want people to understand that if you belong to God, you have an arch enemy and his name is Satan. And he is going to do everything he can to make your life miserable. And I found that in the area of finances. And so when I saw that, I mean, something welled up inside of me. It was righteous anger. And I I pointed at, you know, this open vision where I saw Satan in the enemy's camp. I pointed and I said, no way, Satan, in the name of Jesus Christ, I bind you. I rebuke you right now. And I command you to loose everything that you have stolen from Mike and me. And I send out the harvesting angels right now to gather it up. And I call it into the household of Butod. And I'm going to tell you something. I sat down and made a, a physical list of everything that I knew Satan had stolen from us. Now, in your case, it not in yours personally, Tony, but in, in whoever's hearing this, what what are some things that you know God ha- that Satan has stolen from you? Did you were you in line for a promotion and it went to somebody else? Were you um, in the process of buying a new home and everything fell through and you didn't get it? I mean, what there are many many areas. Perhaps you your desire has been to have a child and the child just never comes. These are ways that Satan is stealing from people and they don't even know They they think it's God withholding these things from them. Many times it's the fact that Satan is robbing us as believers and we don't even have a clue um, who's doing it, why it's happening, and we don't know what to do about it. And I'm here to tell you that something can be done about it. I mean, I have a written testimony of this of this um, testimony that I'm talking about and all the things that started happening. I'll tell you a couple just just to um, seal the deal, so to speak. Um, We have um, an optical business. It's a little mom and pop optical business. And um, this lady came into our office one day and bought a pair of glasses and she wrote us a check for it. The check ended up being insufficient. So I wrote her a little note. I mean, we had had that happen to us in the past. And I said, um, I understand sometimes things happen. And um, I just wanted to let you know that the check that you gave us came back to us insufficient. And um, I'll be happy. I'm holding it here at the office for you to come in and make it good. Never saw the lady again. Um, Also, another lady came in our office and bought a pair of glasses, and they were $260. Uh, She came in to get the glasses, but she only had half the money. So she um, asked my husband, I have 160 of it, and I get paid Friday. This was like a Tuesday. Uh, Would you allow me to take the glasses, and Friday when I get paid, I will come in here and pay you the other half. Well, my husband is a mercy man, and um, so he allowed the lady to take her glasses, and we never saw her again. So I also wrote her a little note to remind her that she was going to come in and give us the balance. Um, Never saw her again, but in this uh, journey of being destitute financially, I had begun to pray 
um, and ask God for mercy from those that we owed. Because I read in the Bible, the man that owed money, the guy came to collect. He was going to sell the man's family and everything for money. And the guy begged and said, you know, please just give me time and I'll pay you. Well, the, the man that came to collect had mercy on the man and forgave the man his debt. And, you know, if I read it in the word, I, I believe, I believe that it can apply to me as well. Now, the, the debt that we were in was not because we just went out and spent lavishly. Um, Tony, I don't know if y'all heard about this in New Zealand, but we live at that time in Jasper, Texas. And there was um, something that happened, a, a horrible thing happened, where um, a black man was dragged to death. And it made worldwide news. The world descended upon our little city when that happened. And it caused business to stand still for several months in our town. And we got behind. We got behind on our house note, on our rent for our business, on all of our uh, people that we owed because we had no business for three months. And so, and then the town, uh, the trial came to town a year later and it, it happened all over again. So these were circumstances beyond our control. And I was crying out to God for help because we were not only in lack, but now we had no income at all. And so our whole of it just got deeper and deeper. And so reading these scriptures about the man that was forgiven his debt, I thought about the people that owed us money. I told my husband, I said, you know what? I am praying for God to forgive our debt. So we're going to forgive these debts. I'm not going to write him any more notes. I'm not even, I'm just going to take their ticket and we're going to put it in a in a bank statement for that month, and we're going to forget about it. We're going to forgive them their debt because if you want forgiveness, you have to forgive. And so we did that. Well, when I learned about the enemy's camp and started praying for everything that he had stolen, Satan had stolen, one day the lady that gave us the insufficient check, and this had been a whole year after this happened, she came in and gave us the money for the insufficient check. The lady who owed the other $130, it had been a year that had passed. She came in and laid the money on my husband's desk. Now, I didn't get it right at first, but we were just in awe, you know, that after a whole year, these people came in and did this until I realized that a couple of months before that happened, I had begun to go to the enemy's camp and command him to lose everything he had stolen and called it into our household. The lady that gave us the insufficient check, the day after she brought the money, she came in with a frame that she had stolen when she was in the office the year before that. And my husband said, well, I never even missed it. What made you bring it back? And she said, well, y'all were just so kind to me that I, I never could do anything with them. So I'm telling you, this is a very real principle here that God revealed. And I encourage you to sit down and make a physical list and go to the enemy's camp and begin to cry out for those things that are also crying out to be in your possession. Wow. That's, that's, yeah, that's very, very thought provoking and very inspiring, actually. Yes. And, you know, it's, you know, today, Mike and I are completely debt free. That was something that my husband back in the 80s decided, you know, we were a one income family. I didn't want to work when I had little children or when my children were at home at all. I didn't want to work. And um, so we bought a house. This is another thing, though, that you might uh, examine because. I had two older brothers, and I learned a lot by their mistakes. They got married. They wanted the big brand new house. They wanted the nice cars. They wanted all the fine clothes. They wanted, and so 
they were living beyond their means, so to speak. It took both my brother and my sister-in-laws to work in order to pay the big house note and to have the things that they wanted to have. And I didn't want to do that because I wanted to stay home with my baby. So we bought a house that we could afford just on Mike's salary. And it wasn't a big fancy house, but it was our home and I loved it. And there was a time that the kind of house that I always dreamed to have, it was never, you know, a huge home, but the kind of house I always dreamed of, I thought we will never have that house that I want on Mike's salary. And so I, I reached a place where I had to become contented with what I had. And see, this is another principle of God. As long as you are not happy with what you have, that you can't be thankful and contented with what you have, then you'll never have those things that you hope for, the bigger, better things. That's what I learned. I'm just sharing what I learned. So when I became contented with that house and I thought, you know, I'm just going to fix this house up like it was the house that I've always wanted. And guess what? We were in that first house for um, 19 years. And then we moved. We bought property. We built the house of our dreams. And God helped us along the way because we built it on a shoestring budget. I'm just telling you that, you know, if to look to God for the things that you desire, but also be thankful for what you have. You know, thanksgiving goes a long way with God. In fact, my mother-in-law, who I was taking care of until she died last month, um, was very discontented with the things that had befallen her and her husband. And, and she was um, complaining about them always. And when we moved in the house with him, she asked me one time, she said, why do you think our life had to end up like this? And I said, well, you know, my mother, who is 91, is healthy, active. She still has her right mind. She's, she still drives. She still goes and does what she wants to do. And I told my mother-in-law, I said, but you know what? She tells me that every night when she lays down in the bed, she thanks God for her healthy body. She thanks God that she still has her right mind. She thanks God. And my mother-in-law said, yeah, but I don't have a healthy body. I said, I know that, but, but you know what? I'm thankful that you can still uh, get up and go to the bathroom by yourself. I'm thankful that you can still eat food. I'm thankful that you still have your right mind. You know, if you are thanking God for the things that you do have, then it doesn't come across as being unthank ungrateful for the things that you have. And I think that we miss it sometimes by not thanking God for the things that we have. You know, I that wasn't the house that I always dreamed of, but Lord, thank you that we have a home, that we own our own home, that we have a place to live, you know, that that it it's something that we can afford. So I think sometimes those two things may go hand in hand is being thankful for what you do have. Yeah, those are very good points. Yeah, the being grateful and, and actually verbalizing that to God and I think doing it often. And also, of course, we have to live honestly. I think, you know, if anybody can't expect God to bless them if they are not living in honesty in any way, shape or form. So that has to be, you know, we have to have a clear conscience before God and and a, and a grateful heart. Uh, and, and when you have that, then you're in a point, I think, where, uh, well, in my experience, you feel that you can actually go to God confidently. So what about the people that are, um, are, are sort of finding that they're 
lack at the moment is hitting there going, well, how do I be grateful because I'm not being able to pay my bills? I'm, I'm really struggling or, you know, and, and nothing's working out. So how do those people begin? How do they be thankful in that situation, firstly? Well, that's a that's a, a tough question. Yeah. <laughs> um, because I've been there myself. And I, I really don't know if I could tell you the turnaround point for me, but I think I think part of it may be that we not be distracted from the things that God would have us be focused on by these distractions. And believe me, a financial uh, lack is a huge distraction. And But, you know, coming against the enemy is also part of that because I tell people that what the devil really loves to do he has this spirit called magnification that he likes to use. And he will take the one area in your life that is not working out well, and he puts that big old magnifying glass on that thing so that we it totally consumes our energies, our thoughts. Um, it becomes a source of torment when we're trying to sleep or just, you know, walk out our day. and. And if you can see it as a distraction and begin to come against that tormenting spirit and commanding it to go in the name of Jesus Christ and then um, commit that mess to God. You know, I ministered to a lady recently whose marriage was, I mean, it was just a mess. And I told her, I said, you know, uh, as you describe your marriage to me, it's like I'm seeing in Genesis where it says that the earth was without form and void. Your marriage is without form and void. But guess what? God put it all in order. And he can do the same thing with your marriage. If your finances are in a mess, guess what? God can take that that, that thing in your life that is without form and void and totally chaotic, and he can bring order to it. So I think it's really important to commit that thing. Lord, this is a mess. This is what I did when my marriage was dead. Lord, marriage was your idea, and mine is broken, and I don't know how to fix it. So if this is going to work out, I need you to tell me what to do. That, that was my prayer. And guess what? Line upon line, precept upon precept, God began to instruct me. I'm talking about little tiny instructions. So once you ask God to help you in that area, be have your ears so in tuned to his voice, like you may just be driving up to a window to get coffee or something, and God will say, no. Then you have to be uh, very willing and careful to begin to obey what he tells you. And then he can help you with your financial problems. My experience, this is going back a little bit, uh, a bit over a year, you know, less than a year and a half, somewhere between then. And I was struggling, you know, I really didn't have a lot of money coming in. And then I started reading George Mueller's autobiography and he trusted God totally in his circumstances here yeah, um, with orphanages. He started off with in the 1800s with just a couple of orphanages in Bristol in England and he trusted God all the way. And for 60-something years, he lived in total trust to God and God laid him some principles to live by and then he ended up uh, 2,000 plus orf orphans they were looking after and, and um, major buildings and God never once let him down. There were times when it was a last minute where God would come through and provide for him but mm -hmm. he never let him down and that was that story profoundly influenced me and I was reading it and here I was really struggling and and then God, I felt God saying, "Well, I I want you to you know to really put everything into a minute to midnight, and um, and I will provide for you." And at this point, I was thinking, oh, "Okay, yeah, and I'll still do this other stuff I had ongoing with my audio things and whatnot." And and 
And then gradually those things started to shut down and, you know, the doors that were open began to all shut down. I was like, oh, my gosh, and how am I going to survive? And yet then I, of course, also I felt God saying to me, I don't want you using advertising and I don't want you doing affiliate marketing and various things like that. I just want you to trust that I'm going to provide and and which was pretty scary. Um, but the but, but the fact that I kind of had read that book and then felt God directly speaking to me and I thought, well, I'm just going to do this. I'm just going to trust it if I just put everything into this pretty much uh, that God will provide because it's his work and um, so I'm just going to be in God's will and be grateful and just believe that he'll do it. It was this kind of a scary place, but I, I began to get a peace about it. And so, like I say, everything else started to fall away. Mm-hmm. And um, and and the the journey's not been easy. You know, there's, there's times it's really, really tight. But I don't know. I, I kind of have this... I just know that God will come through feeling, um, not that I, you know, there's, there's not a heck of a lot left over and it'd be nice to have more and, and, and things, but there's a peace I haven't, haven't had on my finances before. I've just, I think that knowing that you're doing something in God's will, not that I'm perfect and, you know, I know I stuff up a lot, but. I know that basically I'm going the direction God wants me to do. Therefore, God will be the one that provide the means. It's not up to me to worry about how he's going to do it. Just do what I'm supposed to do and then leave the rest in God's hand. And it's kind of been, um, I, I suppose that's been something re- quite revolutionary for me in the last yeah, year, year to year and a half. Um, and it's kind of exciting Mm-hmm. You know, on the edge a little bit, but you know, it's it's, it's ex- yeah, it's exciting because it then puts the onus on God, and then I'm grateful, and I make sure I'm always thankful to God. You know, when money comes in and and a needs met, and if I have something left over that I can actually do something that I want to do with it, it's like praise God. You know, thank you. So yeah, that's just a little bit of my right, story in right. recent times. So. But I yeah, but your whole well, you know, thinking, it tells us in. Oh, sorry, I was just going to say, but your whole thinking about getting back what the enemy's robbed us from, now that's something I really want to get into because I know I've been robbed blind, you know, uh, as you were sharing that. I was thinking, yeah, yes. that's been me. Yeah. Yeah, and so it, that it that was a huge revelation to me, and, and I still go to the enemy's camp. You know, but but the good news is he's restoring those things. That was another part of that thing. Uh, whenever I was speaking to Satan and commanding him to lose everything, and then I remembered a scripture that um, you know Job was restored double, and there was a scripture that came to me. I can't recall it offhand, but it says that when the thief is discovered, he must repay double. There's other places that say seven times whatever, but the one that God brought to me was double, and it reminded me that Job was restored double what he had had, and so. Uh, double's not bad. <laughs> if uh, when something is stolen from you, double is good. And so, you know, that it is inspiring. It inspired me to do it. And then I'll tell you what, I sent that testimony, that revelation out to every pastor that I knew, because I know that pastors above all um, are stolen from tremendously by the enemy. And what you were just sharing is Philippians 4.19, it says, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. We have to remember that God is our provider. And, you know, a lot of people want to be self-sufficient. You know, they're having, having so much that you don't have to have those worries. But I have found that whatever I will commit to the Lord, he will be the Lord over whatever I commit to him. If I want a Lord over a situation, he'll also let me do that. In fact, I'm a very visual person. Uh, I'm not into visualization, but God shows me pictures. And one time I had prayed about something and I was trying to learn to commit things to God and not worry about them and not try to figure them out, not try to take care of it myself. And I had prayed about a situation 
and then a little later in the day, I was thinking, you know, I bet I could, I bet I could call so and so, and they could call, and and I actually had the, the picture of God backing up and sitting down. And see, when I had prayed, he got up and was going to go do it. But when I started taking it back, he backed up and sat down. And I actually heard him say, oh, I thought she was ready for me to do that. But if she wants to do it, I'm going to let her. And I was like, get Mm. up, get up, get up. I won't touch it. (laughs) Yeah, that's a good picture. But it's so true. Yeah, it is. And because our natural tendency is to try and conjure up things and and find ways to, you know, to do it and, 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 and manipulate the situation and almost manipulate God or whatever. But it's not the way we're meant to do it, is it? No. Here's another scripture that I really love, and that's, When Jesus sent the disciples out, he said, provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor a script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. So, and then there's another place, I think it's in Luke, he says to the disciples, he said, when I told you not to bring a purse and all of those things, lacked you anything? And the disciples said, nothing. See, we can, we can depend. He is our provider. Uh, many of us don't know him in that respect, but I'm telling you, he is. And so um, don't be shy to let him be your provider. Mm, that's very good. Very good advice. Yes. When my son graduated from co- medical school, He had all of these ideas, you know, of what he was going to, he was talking about, you know, now that I'm through with school, um, I got to find a wife, I got to find a house, I've got to, you know, uh, start thinking about having children and all of these things. And I said, I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Listen, let me tell you what God has shown me about life. It's kind of like a wagon wheel. You know, you watch these Western shows and the the wagons have these big wheels with the spokes and a hub. I said, all these things that you're talking about are actually spokes on the wheel of life. And but the hub is what holds all the spokes in place so that your wheel can work properly. But you're talking about the spokes and what you really need to be concerned with is taking care of the hub of that wheel, which I find is in Matthew 6, 25 through 33. It talks about, you know, being anxious for nothing. Um, Don't worry about where you're going to lay your head, what you're going to put on your back, what food you're going to have to eat. Look at the birds of the air. They don't spin or toil, but God takes care of them. Aren't you much more important than them? And then he says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and and his righteousness and all these things, all the things my son was talking about will be added unto you. So if we will take care of the most important thing, then all these other things that we strive so far will be added. It is just a natural happenstance of seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Good point. Uh, Putting God first has obviously got to be the number one, number one thing. It's slightly off the track, but recent in recent times, you know, God's really impressed on me the fact that the whole world system is corrupt. And it's the enemy system. And if we try and build our lives around that system, the Babylonian money system, then we aren't actually in God's plan or in God's will. And and to actually kind of get ourselves out of that Babylonian system as far as possible, which is, you know, what, what I'm feeling to do in whatever way it is. And that was part of that for me was the not doing the advertising and not, uh, you know, ad- ads on YouTube videos and, and all of that sort of thing and trying to do things the world's way. And God said, no, I don't want you to do that. Mm-hmm. And then also realising that the the actual 
uh, word in the Bible for money is the same word, word as silver. It's actually silver. So true money is gold and silver, and we've built mm-hmm. this whole financial system on on false. It's all false, you know, um, built on a paper system that is backed by nothing and uh, and and is backed by basically greed. Bank is greed. So the whole system is built on that, and it's like that's not how God designed the system, and we shouldn't be uh, we shouldn't be beholden to that system. So it's like beginning to go, okay, God, how do you want me to function? In that in that world, you know, um, without being to be in the world but not of the world. So that's been part of my journey again uh, for the last period of time, and it's it's ongoing, you know, to to know, okay, right. God, what, how do I do this to do it righteously and in the, in the way? Because I I don't believe God designed the financial system the way it is at all. It's it's totally corrupt. It's built on false weights and scales. And um, so we shouldn't be following that same system ourselves. That's very true. What I found, it, the difference in, in what I'm hearing you're talking about, it's the world system. Um, in, in the world, the means of exchange is, of course, money. But when you become a citizen of the kingdom of God, uh, faith becomes your means of exchange. And what God has shown me is that faith um, is the vehicle that will bring whatever it is you need from the spirit realm into the earth realm in a physical form. It sounds kind of crazy, but but it's so true. I mean, it, it is the explanation of faith in Hebrews 11, verse 1. It says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So, but it's so true that, you know, now um, I see the kingdom of God. Jesus came and he demonstrated principles of the kingdom of God to the disciples. Listen, when Jesus needed tax money, what did he do? He sent the disciples fishing. I mean, I'm still amazed that they went down to the fishing hole. Um, (laughs) I think that shows great faith that Jesus said, go catch that fish and the first fish you bring up will have the money that we need in it. Now that's, that's a miracle. And, and even in, in uh, the needs like, food when he fed the the five thousand he he took two loaves or five loaves and two fishes and he he performed a miracle with it it was a it's a principle of multiplication everything in the kingdom of god has to do with multiplication and increase and if we can tap into that and you know when i began to see that it was like, oh my goodness, Lord, the kingdom of heaven, he says it is within us. We have the kingdom of heaven within us. And so show me how to operate in that. You know, show me how to operate in, in the kingdom like you did when you were here on the earth. He didn't take that with him. Those principles he left here with for us, but how to get those principles to work the way they're supposed to work is is something that I've really been exploring in the last so many years because when it hit me that that Jesus walked in the kingdom of heaven while he was here on this earth and he didn't take it with him he demonstrated it he he stood up in that boat when the storm was raging and he spoke to the wind and the waves and said peace be still and it and it did you know so and and the disciples were marveling over that you know what manner of man is this but Jesus was showing them how to do it and I don't know that they fully understood what Jesus was even showing to them and you know what in Ephesians 3 
when God began to show me some of these things, I was so excited by it, but it made me a little nervous because I would, God would show me things that I did, wouldn't hear anybody else talking about. And I was afraid to talk about them because what are they going to, you know, they're going to think I'm off the wall or something. But in Ephesians 3, Paul says basically the same thing to the disciples. He said, listen, I'm fixing to show you some things that was not known by your fathers before you, but they have been, um, they're being, let me look that up. This is when God showed me to begin to share these things because he was the one showing them to me and he wants his people to know. So let's see, chapter three. In verse one, this is Ephesians 3, verse 1. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you or toward you, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words, by when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which is in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Um, And then there's more and more, but then it says in verse 10, to the intent that now, unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made, might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. So see, he, God reveals things in certain times for that time. Remember the little saying that people picked up on a few years back, for such a time as this? Mm. For such a time as this. There are things that God, oh, and it has, um, let me find where it says this, that it was hidden in Christ In verse 9, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now and to the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose. See, he he has things that are still hidden in him, but they will be revealed at the time that he needs it to be revealed for the purpose that the church might come into the knowledge of these things. And so that was when I read that, I was like, oh, Lord, Thank you for this, because the things that he has begun to show me are things that he wants us to know. They are mysteries that have been hidden in God for a particular time and purpose for the church. And that's what I feel like these things are. And, it, you know, it says that no uh, no scripture is of private interpretation. I know that God is also showing others these same things. I'm I'm not anybody special that he's just showing it to me. No, there are others who God is showing these things because in Joel, it says that, um, I think it's Joel, might be Amos, uh, where he says that in the last days, I shall pour out my spirit upon all flesh that word spirit, when I did a word study on it, it's not just his Holy Spirit. It is, it's a mindset. It's how his mind works. It's how he thinks about things. His desires, his thoughts are going to be poured out on us. And that's, I see this as being part of that, that he's pouring out his desires on 
mankind, his church, uh, to bring about the things that he desires. So he's, he's wanting us to have the same mindset that he has. That's great. Now, can you give our listeners your website? Sure. Uh, you can go to my website by going to Carla, and that's C-A-R-L-A, Butod, B is in boy, U, T is in Tom, A, U, D is in dog, dot com. CarlaButod.com will take you to my website. My email address is on there. Um, as well, and it has upcoming meetings where I will be. It has a couple of books that um, I wrote one, and then the other is co-authored, and those are made available on the website, and um, yeah. That's that's great. I've um, really enjoyed this, that learned a lot. I'm sure our listeners will get a lot out of it, and um, it's powerful stuff, and hopefully it's life-changing and that people will go forth and put these things into practice. So I want to say thank you again, Carla, for being on the A Minute to Midnight show today. It's been uh, fabulous. Thank you, Tony. I've enjoyed it as well. And we will have you back again, no doubt, in the near future. Look forward to it. You can find all of our shows at our website, a minute to midnight.com, midnight spelled M I D N I T E. We put all our shows up there as audio downloads, and there's also links to our shows on YouTube and on iTunes as well. So you can find links to all of those on the A Minute to Midnight website. We do run A Minute to Midnight by donations and there is a donation button on the website and we're really grateful to the people that do help us out that way so I want to thank you to those people that have donated and do donate to us. It's much appreciated. And I write, play and record all the music that you find on our shows and you can find my music, royalty free music, at rockshoresounds.com and there's a link to that on the A Minute to Midnight website as well well that's about it for today's show, thank you for listening this is Tony signing off until the next episode of our show